Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 44. This episode, prepare yourself. It's Hal Hickel. Hal Hickel is the animation director at ILM. He just passed over 20 years at ILM. Like, like guys, guys, this is not a drill, all right? And he has the craziest, coolest stories that is, I'm so excited for you to hear them. And he's such a great dude, and we got along so well. And I'm just so thankful for all the work him and everybody at Lucasfilm and ILM are doing, um, as I'm sure you are as well. Uh, but he started like doing little stop-motion things when he was a kid, saw Star Wars, dreamed one day of working in the movies, and then went through other stop-motion stuff, worked at what later became Leica, worked on Toy Story with Pixar, guys. This is not a joke. I can't, I, I'm so hyped. I'm so hyped about this. And then, dude, he worked on the Three Pirates movies, okay? He worked on episode one. He worked on Boss Nass. He worked on Boss Nass, friends. But he went on to do uh, the Three Pirates of the Caribbean movies, the first three. And he won an Oscar. That's right. I had to give a second, a little moment of uh, appreciation. He won an Oscar for Pirates 2. I had an Oscar winner on my show, guys. We're moving on up. Uh, but Hal is just a super fun, awesome dude, uh, doing amazing things. He d- K2, wait until you hear the K2 stories. K2 is here because of Hal. All right, you're going to love it. I'm done freaking out because I'll just keep on freaking out forever. Uh, but anyway, enjoy this uh, kind of long episode as well. You know, side note, Hal, normally when I record these, are only supposed to be about an hour. But every now and then, they go a little long. I do feel really bad for taking all this time, but he was so gracious and so amazing. And uh, so, Hal, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for your time. Uh, again, you guys aren't ready. You guys are not ready. So I'm going to stop talking. Listen here and enjoy uh, episode number 44 of the Interesting Podcast with Hal Hickel. Theme song time. <laughs> So you listened to the Christopher Patrick Nolan episode. I haven't listened to it yet. Ooh, dude, you're in for a treat. No, I know. I saw, but I saw that your, you know, your post about it, and I was like, oh, that's awesome. But I haven't actually been able to listen to it yet in yeah. its entirety. You're gonna so. like it. You're gonna like it. He's. It's one thing that I've learned is that the people that I have on have the craziest stories that are so much crazier than I originally thought. And with <laughs> with him, it's like okay. You were in the Vader scene, and you were the rebel that got away. That's already nuts. But then I found out his introduction into the industry was being a set dresser. Yeah, and I thought that like, was super cool. Dude, he worked on Pulp Fiction. What? Yeah. To go like to be from Ireland, end up in Los Angeles, work on Pulp Fiction, flash forward oh, twenty years, and you're running take, from Darth Vader. <laughs> I take it back. I have listened to the whole episode. Um, and yeah, his story is really cool. Yeah, Sorry, it's, it's been a bit of the last couple of weeks have been a bit of a blur. Sure, um, sure. Uh, a lot going on. Um, but yeah, no, I love his path. It's so um, weird. Visual effects is like that. There's people always ask me, you know, well, how, you know, what's the best way to get into visual effects? And I mean, now there's a lot more um, schools, like especially like vocational oriented schools than than when I was growing up. But what I like about visual effects is you you always meet people who've come into it from such crazy. Uh, odd paths, you know, oh, like yeah. all over the map. But anyways, yeah, for sure. Where Where are you from? Uh, my childhood was split between Southern California. I, I lived in Riverside, which is east of LA. Cool. Um, until I was ten, and then we moved to Colorado to a little tiny town called Shawnee, which really? is up in the Rockies. Um, my my dad my dad's dad was a cattle rancher. My dad was a high school English teacher, but we moved out there to. Uh, take on the work of the ranch as as my granddad was getting on in years. So we lived there for a while, and then um, later on, I ended up in Portland, Oregon, with my mom, 
and was there for a good, I guess, 15 years from sort of high school, early adulthood, um, and then moved to the Bay Area at the beginning of 95. Really? That is... So I've actually... Yeah, I've lived here longer than anywhere else, but um, but yeah. Sure, that's, that's a good good bouncing around, though. Which, one, uh, which one's home? I think this is home now. Yeah. When I first moved here, it was it was Portland, for sure, but... I've been here long enough now that I think I think this is it. And and but honestly, what I think of as my childhood home is uh-huh. is Shawnee in in Colorado. Um, gotcha. That's, that's a lot more firmly embedded in my mind, and because I was older, I guess. Um, but then then the um, then the ten years I lived in in Southern California and Riverside. Sure, that makes sense. I have never been to Colorado. I'm going it's- to Colorado later this year, though. So it's lovely. What should I expect? Is the, is the but, air really thinner because the elevation? Oh yeah, I mean yeah. you know once you get up to elevation, I mean it's not that way everywhere in the oh, state. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the entire state is on a plateau. <laughs> yeah, the, the town uh, Shawnee mm-hmm. was eight thousand plus feet, and yeah, I mean if you're not used to it, if you're if you're from some place that's a lower elevation, um, you'll you'll notice it right away, especially if you, I don't know, jog or something like that. Um, Right. Absolutely. I mean, you're not going to walk around wheezing unless you yeah. <laughs> have asthma or something. But yeah, if you exert yourself, you'll you'll notice right away the um, the difference. Absolutely. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So obviously, it's beautiful. That's where the Rockies are. It is. Yeah. A lot mountains. of a lot of natural beauty there. I think the only mountains I've seen, like proper mountains, were uh, I, I drove through Tennessee uh-huh. when I was yep. younger, and there's great roads that go along the sides of mountains. Uh, <laughs> They're scary. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't oh, yeah, I, you, you can find that in Colorado for sure. Weird, yeah. crazy little roads that just have a sheer drop off on one side, and yeah. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> same in same in uh, in Ireland. Ireland, they're like oh, yeah. crazy mountains with like really tiny dirt roads, and they're all driving <laughs> like seventy kilometers an hour. I'm like, what is wrong <laughs> with you people? <laughs> they're just nuts. I haven't driven anywhere yet where they drove on the other side of the road. I've driven in uh, Germany and France uh, oh, where they, they drive the same side as us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Germans are, like, great drivers. Sure. And, and super rule-based. Yeah. <laughs> and the French, not that. so much. The, the, the French, not, not so much. They, I, would, I found they, on little country roads, they would overtake and pass Oh no! With no <laughs> visibility whatsoever, you know, you're on, you're coming over a hill, you're going around a bend. They, they don't care. They'll, sure. they'll just still a good time to pass. Um, they, they can just smell that you're American, and they're like, nope. <laughs> but he's too careful. I can tell. That's right. Yeah. They have no respect for our way of driving. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh man, there, there was like a learning curve in Ireland. I I took my parents with me, and we made my dad drive because he's been all over the world. And the first, I want to say three days or so, I rode in the front seat, and I kept thinking we were going to run into the curb or, like, <laughs> into the cars. And I was like, what is happening? It was, it was so stressful. It was the worst. Yeah, I've been to, to London a lot, and whenever I'm in a car there, um, just, you know, as a passenger or a cab or anything, yeah. I just, I, I think about it a lot. Like, I watch the where they're driving, and I try to imagine myself in the driver's seat <laughs> taking that on, and it just seems... Scary, yeah. To me, especially in London, I think I don't Same. think I'm ever going to want to do that. Same. Maybe out countryside, sure, but um, but not in the heart of London. No. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I'm with you. I was I went to London down that trip as well, and it's massive and crazy and uh, hard pass. I'm gonna take a hard pass on that one. I mean, the map, the street map of London looks like a, a windshield that's been cracked. It you know, does. With all the, the crazy <laughs> little streets going everywhere. I mean, that is it, the perfect not... metaphor. <laughs> it's exactly <laughs> what it looks like. <laughs> There's no grid. It's just no. like there was dirt here at one point, and we put cobblestones on top of it, and then asphalt yeah. on top of that, and it's just it's a street, I guess. Yeah. Crazy. Which is all the more impressive that you can jump into any black cab there. Yeah. And an address and off they go they don't you know Crazy. turn on the gps or anything they just they know it and they go it's amazing they just know i was talking <laughs> to tom wilton and he was saying that i was like how do you drive in london he goes well i used to think it was an accomplishment but then i drove in india <laughs> <laughs> and he's like then i realized london isn't that bad <laughs> right right yeah i guess it's always a matter of 
There, there's always something else somewhere yeah. you could point to. Yeah. It could yeah. always be worse. It could yeah. be roundabouts with seven lanes instead of yeah. the two and three. <laughs> crazy, crazy. You you shared that uh, that photo like a week or two ago of you in Cub Scouts. Oh yeah. Did you make it to Boy Scouts? Nope. Me neither. I did like a yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, I made it to Weebelows, right? Which was sort of between Cub Scouts and, and yep. on Boy Scouts. Um, and that was about it. And I, I didn't dislike it, but it, I, I just at some point I realized that it, I don't know, the uniforms and everything just kind of weren't my my sure. deal. Sure. Um, but I liked it. I liked the beginning of it. You know, I had, you know, I had good friends and stuff, so. You, it was got nice. there, you got in there long enough to get like your totem chip and you're like, I can carry a knife. I'm out. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> How do you build a fire? That is literally all I need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hit like 12 years old and I was like, mom and dad, I'm just way too busy. I can't do this anymore. And they're like, what? <laughs> My brother <laughs> stayed in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Crazy. Well, it's cool that they, they listen to you and you know. Yeah. Those boobs. <laughs> <laughs> I was just a kid. I didn't know it. What? Why did it? <laughs> Why would you listen to me? <laughs> I, knew, I knew nothing. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. not. Uh, you let me carry a knife. <laughs> <laughs> Start fires. That's yeah. right. <laughs> That's all you need. That's that is the perfect remedy for anything a child is going through: weapons <laughs> and fire. Yeah. So horrible. So, so okay. So you did that. When did your interest in animation start then? Um. Around then, a little before then, I, I got sense. interested because I saw King, the original 33 King Kong on TV. Yeah. Was, living in Riverside in Southern California. I saw it on TV, and I was really uh, angry about Kong's treatment in the film. <laughs> you know, kill him, and it really upset me. Fair. And so I, my mom helped me write a letter to the local TV station who I, I held accountable for this, and... Um, I, I think she actually mailed it. I don't know for sure. I mean, she, she helped me write it for sure. And I, I think she actually put a stamp on it and threw sure. it in the mail. But, <laughs> it went in the mailbox. That, don't know if that, it went anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I started to get um, really interested in how the film was made. And, of course, this was, you know, well before the Internet or anything like it. And sure. even the local library generally didn't have a lot of information. But I did find, ultimately, a couple of good books about the making of King Kong. Uh, there were two books. One was called The Making of King Kong, and the other one was called The Girl and the Hairy Paw. And they were big, um, you know, sort of coffee table-ish making of books with lots of pictures and lots of discussion about how stop motion worked and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that got me hooked. That That's what got me interested. So it was that, and then I, you know, I would start to watch. Uh, well, I was already watching. My brother and I both loved... Um, you know, like the old universal horror movies or sure. really any science fiction or creature movie that would be on TV back then. Um, so naturally I started to see Ray Harryhausen's films and recognized that that was also stop motion and, and became an, an instant fan of his. Um, sure. And so that's how, that's how it started. And I uh, got a Super 8 camera along the way and, and started to make my own puppets and stuff. Really? Yeah, and that was all before Star Wars came out. So that was early seventies. Yeah. Um, so I was making making stuff. Nothing I mean, you know, no epics or anything, but I would just take my camera out and spend an hour just shooting some little stop motion thing or, or other and and then decide to do something else, you know. Sure. And that stuff. So but I was you know, I learned the basics of stop motion and would read everything I could get my hands on. There wasn't even Cinefax then. It was just, you know, if you could find books about it. Um, you know, did you were lucky? Sure. Uh, and then, at some point, right before Star Wars came out, Starlog magazine appeared, and uh, it wasn't yes. about filmmaking, but it was about science fiction stuff. And then occasionally they would have articles in there about movies, and sometimes those articles would be about special effects. And so there was that as well, right? Uh, and, and and a few other. There was Cine Fantastique as well, which was which also had good articles on effects. So. Sure. Yeah. That's, so that's crazy. A lot of people for, that I've talked to, like King Kong was the start for yeah. a ton of stuff. I think even Mark Hamill, like one of his big things that got him into movies and creatures was the original King Kong. Tom that's, Spina, same thing. Yep. That's nuts. So what was the what was the puppets that you made? I made it. Well, the first puppet I made was King Kong. I still have it. It was a, um, what? 
it was a GI Joe, right? Which back then GI Joes were about they were one six scale, so they were about I don't know eight or nine inches tall, sure, or so seven or eight inches tall. Mm-hmm. Um, these you know plastic jointed figures, and so I got one of those, and my mom helped me make like a basically a gorilla suit for it out of this kind of brown fuzzy material. That's awesome. And I had a mom. I had a model kit of King Kong that Aurora made and I took the face piece off of that and I put it on the, you know, the face of my Kong. Mm -hmm. And, and so that was it. I would animate him shuffling around and kicking over matchbox cars and climbing cardboard buildings and stuff. What? Yeah. That is crazy. And you did this. So explain to me the super eight, because I know it's the old camera, but I've never used one and doing stop motion uh, what I know of it is is just pictures, pictures instead of frames, so it moves. Does the Super 8 work that way as well? We had to like take it, move it, take it, move it. Yeah, Super 8 was a was a film format. So mm-hmm. you know, regular before we everything went digital, regular movies are usually thir- on thirty five millimeter film. Right. The, the film itself is thirty five millimeters wide, um, and then of course you have occasionally seventy millimeter films, and the films twice as wide. Um, mm-hmm. But there was a there was a you know a consumer grade film format back in the day <clears throat> called super eight and so it was eight millimeters wide and so of course the image was very tiny and of a lower quality than what you'd find even on 16 millimeter but certainly less than 35 but it was good enough for you know family shooting their home movies yeah of course. and some of these yeah and some of these cameras these super eight cameras had a uh, an option on them where you could shoot a single frame at a time not all ah. of them had yet the kind that had that capability gotcha and, you set up your movie camera and your lights and your little set and you move your puppet a tiny little fraction and shoot one frame and then move it a tiny bit more and shoot one frame and uh, you know, so on and so forth. And then when the film is played, you know, at speed, you get the illusion of, of movement of life. So. Sure. Okay. And this was even before star Wars. Oh yeah. Ahead of the curve, my friend, ahead of the curve. <laughs> <laughs> so when, well, star, when star Wars came out, you're a kid. What was that like? Well, that really, <clears throat> kind of cemented the deal because before Star Wars came out, I probably had an equal fascination with NASA and sort of space things yeah. um, as I did with with filmmaking. Sure, um, I, they were both kind of vying for you know what was really going to capture my imagination. But then Star Wars came out, and you know I loved the the fantasy of Star Wars certainly, and I, and actually it, I couldn't have been a more perfect um, target because I was. 13, I was living on a ranch in a tiny little town in Colorado, and I wanted to, you know, basically go to the stars, right? Sure. And so here's Luke Skywalker. He's living on a little farm in the middle of nowhere. He wants to go to the stars. I was just like, wow, that, you know, it's me. But as much as I loved, um, you know, that aspect of it, the fantasy of it and the story of it, because I was already interested in stop motion and, and making special effects of that kind, I got super interested in how they made the movie. You know, I, Mm -hmm. I could look at the chess game and say, Oh, well that's stop motion. I know how they do that. Sure. But I wanted to know how did they do the lightsabers? How did they make Luke's speeder appear to float? How did they do the spaceship shots? How did they do, you know, the, the big um, matte painting shots like the, um, you know, where Ben goes to shut down the tractor beam and you see down into the depths of the death star. I'm like, how did they, you know, they did, that's not a set. I can tell it's too big. Yeah. Make that. So, it broadened my interest just generally in visual effects and also kind of shifted me to the point where I was like, yeah, this, that's what I want to do for a living. I, I want to do that in some way or other. You know, I wasn't sure yet that it would be about character animation at that time. It could have been a model builder or, or running one of these motion control cameras that they had or whatever, you know, any, any part of that process was fascinating to me. Sure. Sure. So you, but that's you... what that film did for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, that was the movie that changed the entire world. It's crazy. Yeah. And it transformed the visual effects industry in California for sure. Oh, sure. Um, I believe it. it. It really did. Yeah. Man, so you so I've I've heard this great story and I want to hear half of it and we'll get to the other half later, but okay. you saw the first movie and then you wrote a letter to Gary Kurtz about well, a, about a sequel idea. Am I am I correct in this? Yeah, I mean, sometime in the first, in, you know, I forget exactly when, but they, after the film had been out for a while, there was, you know, it was in the press that they were going to make a sequel. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, oh, this is my chance. So yeah. <laughs> I wrote a letter. I didn't write it to Gary. I just wrote it to, I don't know, whatever. To, to, to whom something. it may concern. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I don't even remember where we sent it because I know I wasn't, 
I don't think I was part of an official fan club then. I'm not sure how we got the address. Anyways, it made it. It's made it. It made its way there. You know that one was sent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and um, and it was a dumb. You know, I, I mean, it's sweet, but it was a dumb, some dumb idea about you know. Because back then we didn't, we still didn't know that Luke and Leia were brother and sister. So it was like natural to assume that they were going to be a thing and maybe they'd have kids and they'd have these adventures and whatever, you know, yeah, something. Of course. Like that. Um, and so I got a, I got the letter sent back to me with a, with a letter from um, Gary Kurtz's assistant, Bunny Olson. Yeah, there we go. And she, um, she typed a letter herself, which, and so the letter was, uh, it wasn't a form letter, but it was pretty straight. It was, it was like, um, you know, she said, thank you for your, you know, story submission, but we're writing the story on our own and our lawyers have advised us not to read, you know, this, the standard thing that now oh, yeah. of course, I understand because, you know, otherwise people pop up and sue you for plagiarism or whatever. So they don't, oh, yes. and so it was kind of disappointing, but I had written also with my letter, I had said, you know, I really want to come and work on these movies. You know, what, what can I, how can I do that? And so she said, uh, she said, getting into Hollywood takes a combination of talent and luck and mm-hmm. usually requires an agent. Yeah. <laughs> and, At least uh, she's I honest. <laughs> I got this letter and I was like, you know, on one, on one side, it was kind of a little, a little bit crushed, like, oh, OK. But um, but I kept it. And as the years went on, I started to realize how cool it was, because one, it wasn't just like some, uh, I don't know somebody in like the fan club sending me like a form letter back, like, thanks for your interest in star Wars. Sure. It was like, it was actually written and typed by, by bunny, by Gary Kurtz, the producer's um, assistant. Sure. And she wrote herself. And it was on this cool, I still have it. It was on this cool um, Ralph Macquarie letterhead. And it said like mm-hmm. the star Wars company or whatever. And so, you know, it actually ended up being super cool. Um, even though, you know, at the time I was hoping they'd write me back and say, of course, we're flying you to Hollywood. And we, yeah, you know. exactly. <laughs> I'll be your agent. <laughs> exactly. I, I hear you. I, I have a slightly uh, not as cool story in, in the same sort of form. So this was around, I want to say episode two came out. Ooh. So this is like around like 2002 or so. I'm horrible with right. years. And I remember they had these like mini Twix bars, like the bite sized ones, and they had Star Wars trivia on the back. And you would have like the, the question, and then you would lift up the little lip on the candy bar, and they would have the answer. And like, I uh, see, 2002, so I would have been 11. And I remember reading this the trivia question was, What is Yoda's home planet? And then you flip <laughs> it up, and it says Dagobah. And I was like, This, this is not true. This is an that's inaccurate cool. fact that's being spread about. So I called the number to Mars Candy Bars, <laughs> and I left this thing. And I was like, listen, my name's Brian. I live in Florida. Um, so George Lucas specifically said that he would never tell us Yoda's species or home planet. And, like, your candy bar says it's Dagobah. And, like, that's just untrue. I just wanted to let you guys know uh, so you can fix this uh, ahead of time in case more candy bars get out there. <laughs> it's very important. Yeah. 11-year-old me was very, very upset about it. I was like, this, this is false, and George Lucas is going to find out, and, and I can't have this. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> it took three days, and I got a voicemail back. And they basically <laughs> said, the, like you said, the very cookie cutter, like, well, listen, we have the rights uh, to this, and um, you know, thank you for your call, but uh, have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> <You're> it's just... wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, it's not true. That's where I understand the misconception, but that's not where he's from. It's so funny. <laughs> but similar sort of thing. I kept that voicemail for like a year and a half. I was like, Mars called me back. <laughs> I made it to the top. <laughs> that's good. I, I relate. I relate. <laughs> In a slightly less cool way. Oh, it's good. It's good. Uh, so, so when you when you decide, okay, animation's the way you want to go. What yeah. program and equipment did you start on? Um, well, if there were any programs then. I mean, or if there were, they were. Oh yeah, of course. In the hands of people at universities doing the very earliest, you know, iterations of of computer graphics. But sure. So it was film. It was film, and I had my Super 8 camera. Um, but around the time. That Star Wars came out. Uh, Cine Fantastic did had a terrific double issue that year. It was a magazine. Uh, I don't know if they're still around. I don't think they're still around. But 
mm-hmm. that a terrific double issue that was all about the the creation of the special effects for both Star Wars and Close Encounters, which both, both came out that year. Oh, okay. And Dennis Muir, by the way, worked on both films, which is yes, a, a totally amazing accomplishment. But anyways, um, and in this, and it was the first really good article of that kind that I'd ever read that really got into uh, not just a lot of the jargon and the, the technology, but it t- they interviewed a bunch of different people on the crew. Mm-hmm. And one of the people they interviewed was this guy, Adam Beckett. And he was in charge of the animated effects. Uh, so like laser blasts and lightsabers. Sure. And, stuff like that. and he animated um, when the Jawas zap R2-D2 and those little blue electrical arts crawl yes. over. Uh, Adam uh, animated that. And his, his inspiration for that was the id monster from Forbidden Planet, which Josh Meter um, animated. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So um, anyway, so I read his, his interview because I was really fascinated by that that kind of work. And he talked about a lot about um, the California Institute of the Arts, Cal Arts in mm-hmm. uh, that, Valencia. And um, and so that I just like, all right, well, that's I'm going to go there. That's what I'm going to do. So sure. I kept that in the back of my mind going through, you know, junior high and high school and um and i applied when i graduated from high school and and went to cal arts so that was oh right on. that was path for me at the at the time because mm-hmm. back then there weren't nowadays you've got all these schools and colleges around the country and around the world um some of them are arts programs many of them are kind of vocational like you know they actually train you to use maya and different softwares and sort of get you you know, the idea is to get you sort of ready to join the visual effects industry. Sure. But back then there was nothing like that. There were a handful of good art and film programs like Cal Arts and NYU and, and some others, USC. But there weren't any places that trained you to work in visual effects. That just didn't exist. And there was darn little that would train you to work even just as an animator. Sure. Right? Cal Arts had quite a good animation program. And um, anyway, so so I ended up going there. Gotcha. OK. OK. That's pretty cool. I mean, it, it's one of those things when you get the path laid out for you. And Cal right. Arts, Cal Arts, how was that? What, like uh, having an interest in it for so long, and then you're starting down this path, and you're learning all these new things. That must well, be pretty cool. The, so now, now here's the needle scratch moment. Of course, of <laughs> course, you're right. <laughs> um, I loved Cal Arts. Absolutely loved it. But, um, I sense a but, but. <laughs> yeah, there's a but. So this is 1982, 83. Um, there isn't uh, – Reagan had slashed a lot of um, uh, yes. student aid, mm-hmm. and my folks didn't have the the funds to just pay for my college outright. So my fear there was mostly college loans, and uh. and I was terrified because sure. it, wasn't like, it wasn't like I thought, oh, well, I'm, yeah, but I'm going to get out of here, and I'm going to make so much money. Right. Um, there was no expectation of that. I, I wanted to work in film and in visual effects because I loved it, but I didn't have any expectation of making tons of money. And so the debt really terrified me. Yeah. So I ended up, I ended up uh, bailing out after the first year, which was crazy because I wanted to go there for years and years. And I did. I loved it there. It was great. Right. And and to be honest, for pretty much the whole decade following that, so like pretty much all of the eighties, mm-hmm. I frequently would think about returning to Cal arts and, and think, you know, I, you know, maybe I really messed up and maybe I should have stayed, you know, I, sure. I, uh, and I still don't think, uh, I still don't look back on that and think, ah, I didn't need to stay. I did. Okay. I actually, you know, if anybody ever asked me, I'm like, look, if you have the, the means and the, to go to a, a good arts program or a good art school, um, do it. Cause it's great. I sure. Mean, you're around a bunch of like-minded people. You can grow as an artist and, you know, for all those reasons. Um, of course. So I still totally recommend it. It's just at the time, it just didn't seem doable to me. It seemed scary to, to, to be incurring a bunch of, of debt. And uh, so, yeah, so I bailed. Gotcha. So, wait, you only your only schooling was Cal Arts, or you went somewhere after that? Or? Nope, that's it. I'm an art school dropout. Wow. I, keep, I should get a T-shirt that says that, except, like I said, I... I'd like to encourage young people yeah. to get education, so I don't want to walk around looking like I'm all proud of it. But yeah, I'm an art school dropout. That is incredible. Um, so yeah, so I went back up to Portland where I had been, you know, living at that time before going to Cal Arts, and 
got work at a little uh, animation studio there that did uh, motion graphic stuff like titles and logos sure. and things like that. And, um, and that was my first uh, working experience in the industry. Was, was what? There. Yep. That is crazy. So you have one, one of your child arts kept going. And, dude, you just hit, congratulations, by the way, over 20 years at ILM. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. First off, last, thank last you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your work, as as you know. Uh, so, wow, that is that is amazing. It just goes to show some things are just you know they're just meant to be. So yeah, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't sure I was going to end up there. I worked at that one little shop for for four years, and then I ended up working at Will Vinton Studios in Portland for another six and a half years doing clay animation. They they've since become um, Leica, you know, the studio that what? Did and Kubo. Hold on. But before that, they were Will, Will Vinton Studios, and I, I was there for six and a half years. And You can't just gloss over this, Hal. You, <laughs> you, you're telling me you, you CalArts for a year, and you're like, eh, and then you go and do some titles, and then you work on what became Leica? Yeah. What? We were They were doing the, the California Raisins, which were this sort of... Yes, I remember them. Oh, I had the toys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, and so they were kind of blowing up. They had they were growing and hiring, and and uh, I had a good buddy there, Vince Backyberg, who was already working there. And he said, "Oh, you should come work here. You know, you used to do stop motion when you were young. You'll be great." And we're having a lot of fun here, and we're doing these big national commercials and stuff. So I did. I, I sent a tape over and got hired, and uh, we worked worked there for six and a half years. It was good. And what? my ho- and that's actually what refocused me on character animation and okay. I, and um i mean i still kept active with the other aspects of visual effects that i liked like for instance sure um you know they did stop motion animation there but stop motion animation requires cameras that can move incrementally as well if, if you have a, a camera that's moving during a shot okay and so to do that the camera is connected to sort of a, a machine that moves it um under sure. computer control and it's similar to how the models were filmed in at ILM you know it's called motion sure. control when you've got these cameras that can kind of swoop around and shoot shoot the models so we had a, a smaller version of that at Vinton's and I got very interested in kind of doing that and being good at that um in in addition to to you know animating characters and the rest of the the job of an animator there. so I had some other stuff there that um that I enjoyed doing that kept me sort of more broadly involved in, in effects than, than just solely about animating, but yeah. it's still, it was the job that kind of got me back refocused on, on character work as opposed to, um, I don't know, almost anything else I might've enjoyed doing in visual effects, sure. like, like animated effects, uh, like, uh, the stuff I talked about that Adam Beckett had done. It, it sort of shifted me off of that and got me more, more focused on characters, which was good because then that job led to, a stint to Pixar and then from Pixar to, to ILM. Dude, what? I <laughs> wow, I didn't know that at all. I'll have, yeah, I'll have you know, one of the only movies that ever made me like legit cry was done by Leica, and it was Kubo and the Two Strings. That's so, great. Uh, yeah. Oh, dude, that that, that movie wrecked me. It's horrible. It's <laughs> horrible. At the end. I just like kept crying and I couldn't stop. And I was with my fiance. I was like, we need to talk about something else. I just... <laughs> Horrible. So like a thanks, but no thanks, but thanks. <laughs> that is yeah, nuts. But the irony is that, um, so, you know, when I left CalArts and I went to work at this motion graphics house, I was really interested in that kind of stuff, motion graphics, backlit graphics. So yeah. it would be stuff like um, the Stargate sequence in 2001. Yeah. Or the kinds of logos they used to have on network television with like streaks and glittery stuff and all. So anyways, I was I was interested in all that. Mm-hmm. But right when I started to actually work in that in the early '80s was right when the whole technique for doing that kind of work was changing over from the way we were doing it to computer graphics. Right. It was like the first thing that computer graphics really made inroads in um, mm-hmm. all the broadcast graphics stuff. So all through the '80s, I kind of watched as the kind of work I was doing was kind of slowly being taken over by computer graphics. And I didn't really have any way, it seemed to me, of, of getting into that. I, I didn't know much about computer graphics. That, and back then it was very specialized. You couldn't just, like, go out and buy. I mean, the Amiga did come along somewhere in there, but whatever. Anyways, it, mm-hmm. I, I kept 
I kept it the more traditional stuff. Anyway, so toward the end of that, then I shift over to, to Vittens and I start doing stop motion and I start thinking, this will be my path to working at ILM or working for Phil Tippett or whatever. I'll be a stop motion animator yeah. or or maybe a motion control camera operator. One of those two things, because both of those were still a big thing. Right. Then, right in the middle of my time at Vintons, what happens? Jurassic Park comes out. Yeah, it's changed everything. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, now I don't even know what I'm going to do for a living because <laughs> now, now computers are doing this other thing that I wanted to do, and I still don't know any more about them. Sure. The only the only um, real contact I had with computers was was with the, the PCs that ran the um, the motion control cams, and they just used a single piece of software. It was a stuff called Cooper Controls, and that's mm-hmm. that's all I knew. I just I knew how to work that, but I didn't know broadly about computers or, or anything about com- computer graphics. Right. But I started to you know try to read whatever I could get my hands on and read every article of Cinefax and et cetera. Um, and, and, but, you know, again, like I said, at that time it was a little doom and gloom because I was just thinking, you know, these are all people with computer science degrees and they're wearing lab coats and, you yeah, know, this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I can't, I'm not good. I'm thinking it's not realistic for me to go back to college at this point and try and get, but you know, right. anyways. And then, um, this is uh, late 94, mm-hmm. um, Pixar was getting a little bit behind on Toy Story and they needed more animators. And um, some of the animators they had hired there in the Bay Area, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, were sure. former stop motion animators. Some of them had come from Skellington and were, you know, needed work before James and the Giant Peach was starting up. And some of them had also come from a, a, a stop motion TV series that was shot at the Bay Area that was called Bump in the Night. Oh, and so, yes. I remember um, Bump in the Night. And so one of these stop motion animators knew one of the animators at Vinton's and, and called her, um, Teresa Drilling, and called Teresa and said, hey, you know, we really need anim- animators. Do you have any interest in this? And she didn't. She loves stop motion. She's still, she's brilliant at it, and she still does it to this day. She directs now, and she's really good at it. And she just didn't have any interest in computers, computer graphics, but she knew that I'd been trying to kind of wrap my head around it and figure out how I could still kind of move forward. Sure. So she said, hey, you know, you should send a reel down. Apparently they don't care if you know anything about computers. Their software is, used, you know, anime, uh, artist friendly and um, they'll, they'll show you how to use it. So so I sent a reel down from Vinton's, a reel that, by the way, I could never get hired <laughs> today with. Of course, of course. Year. But they were pretty desperate. And, um, and so it was a massively lucky break for me. And I, I got hired. I, I was work, animating on Toy Story and... And it turned out that um, this thing that was seemed so scary and was going to basically, you know, put a stop to the career I wanted to have, I actually liked it. I sure. liked animating in the computer. It was interesting to me. It wasn't just something I was doing grudgingly so I could have a job. It was actually, I thought it was cool. I liked it. I was excited. I liked the movie a lot. I mean, I liked Pixar. Oh, yeah. And the other thing I learned is that um, the motion control camera work I'd been doing actually prepared me for animating in the computer in a way that I, I had no idea it was doing. Really? Because, because if you picture, and there are a lot of different configurations, but a yeah, typical motion control camera is you have, you have a pair of, of metal tracks on the floor, mm-hmm. like a rig of tracks, but they're, they're metal. Right. And sitting on top of that is a, is a rig that, that rolls on those tracks. And, and on that rig, you might have kind of a tower with a carriage that can move up and down the tower. Right. And then a boom arm coming out from that and suspended from the boom arm is a camera with a pan and tilt hip. So you have a motor that controls uh, where you are along those tracks, how high you are on the tower, mm-hmm. uh, what the pan angle is and what the tilt angle are of the of the camera, and then probably another motor to control the focus of the camera. Okay. So that's, I don't know, what, six, five, six axes of motion. Right. And then all those motors are plugged into a big box and that box is plugged in the computer and the computer you have software. And so what you do is you have this controller and you, you drive the thing down the track, you raise it up, you tilt the camera until it's framed on the thing you want. And you set values, you set keys on all these values on the track, on the tower, on the pan, on the tilt, on the focus. And then you go, all right, so four seconds later in the shot, um, I need, you know, 96 frames later, I need to be uh, down at this end of the track and the camera now needs to be down low and I need to be panned over here and tilted up and the focus sure. is there. 
And then the computer does the in-between those two positions. It figures out how to get the camera from there to there. And then if in the middle of that move you're like, oh, but the framing isn't so good here in the middle, then you set more keys, you adjust the pan, and you set some more keys in the middle, et cetera. That's how you program a motion control move. Sure. Well, that's how, that's how you animate a character in the oh. computer. You move like the, it's like a puppet. You pose the puppet on frame one. You go, all right, this is how he starts the shot. You go forward maybe 10 seconds, and you create another pose, another key pose, and you set key values on all the parts of the puppet, you know, where the foot's sitting, where the wrist is, where the head is. Mm -hmm. And then in a little further and a little further, and you don't do every frame like stop motion. You just do these key poses. Sure. And then the computer fills in in between. And that looks terrible because the computer (laughs) thinks perfect. Of course. And and you go back and you do breakdown poses and you you massage the splines, you know, the the, the lines that connect these key poses in the computer software Mm -hmm. until the motion looks like what you want. And so when I got in there, I was like, oh, this is like programming a motion control camera move, except it's a character. And so I was able to take the experience that I'd had at Vintons of animating characters plus this motion control camera stuff and put those together and it was like oh i'm actually kind of kind of prepared for this you know so it was a good anyway and then the irony that this thing that was going to take over my career and ruin it <laughs> it being gr- gr- this great door opening right and this awesome opportunity so you know it was, it was that wasn't that was all great sure well i mean i love that adage you know luck is preparation meets opportunity yes and that's yep. that is a truth that i constantly run into having people on this show it's, right. uh, yeah. That's incredible. To I mean, dude, you just sent in a reel. Next thing you're working on Toy Story, like one of the biggest animated movies ever. Yeah, that was a that was a lucky. It was a lucky break for a lot of in part, you know, for ob- the obvious reasons in terms of career and moving up and stuff. But also just to get a chance to work at Pixar when it was tiny and it was their first feature and yeah. that film, you know, that I look back on it now, like you know, that was a real stroke of luck, and I'm very. Very happy. Sure. And then, so, actually, that's pretty crazy. So you worked on, and I'm, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, and then I'll come back. You worked yeah. on Pixar's first feature and, correct me if I'm wrong, ILMs. The, animated, uh, the first animated. animated feature, yes, that's true. Yeah. What? How? This is pretty cool. <laughs> this is pretty cool stuff. Dude. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. All right, so, okay. What was so? Then, how did you get from Pixar to ILM? Just another send your reel opportunity, or? Well, so you know, at that point now, I'm living in the Bay Area, so I'm just across the bay from where ILM is. Sure. Um, and a few years before that, around the time that ILM was making Jurassic Park, uh, actually, no, I take it back. Before they started on Jurassic Park, when they, I think, right after they'd finished the work on T2 on Terminator 2. Oh yes. Um, Will Vitton, who who owned and ran the studio in Portland I worked for, Mm -hmm. he and some other folks in Portland started um, a really good filmmaking conference. Actually, it it wasn't just about filmmaking, but it was called the Portland Creative Conference. And they would invite, you know, creative, interesting people from a lot of different walks of life to come and speak. And it was really a cool thing. And the very first year they did it, um, they had these great roster speakers, um, Spike Lee and Caleb Deschanel, the the, uh, director and cinematographer. A um, bunch of other great people. And, and Dennis. Dennis Muren was one of the um, speakers. Mm-hmm. And so um, Will had kindly, you know, said to everyone at, at his company, look, you know, we'll, any of you who want to go, we'll get you tickets and you can go to this thing. And so I said to Will, look, I don't know if it's, it'll, if it's possible, but if there's any opportunity this weekend, I'd love to be introduced to Dennis because, you know, I was a massive fan of yeah. my work and, of course, Dennis's work and – um, and so Will introduced me at the, this opening event for the, for the thing. And then I went to Dennis's talk. And then at the closing party, um, at the end of the conference, I got a, another opportunity to chat with Dennis a bit. And, and so he was very kind, you know, he was very, um, supportive of me and, and, uh, encouraging, you know, he would say, well, you know, when you're ready, you know, send it, send a reel down, you know, you gotta come down and, you know, work on some stuff down here. And, and that just meant you know, the world to me. And yeah, so of course. stayed in touch, you know, I'd write a letter now and then to ask how he was doing, what they were working on. And then uh, at some point I had a buddy who was getting married down in Santa Barbara. So I drove from Portland down to Santa Barbara and on the way I, before I went, I sent a letter to Dennis saying, well, I'm going to be coming through the Bay area. Would it be all right if I came by to visit ILM? Nice. And 
of course, you know. And so that was the first time I, I went there. And it was kind of nice because it was and – and so that visit is when they were working on Jurassic Park. They were right in the middle of Jurassic Park. Ah, okay. It was, it was really fun because Dennis was – I could – he, he was clearly really excited about what they were doing, uh-huh. but he couldn't show any of it to me. <laughs> <laughs> they took me all over the studio and he showed me all the spaces and all the equipment and all the cool stuff, mm-hmm. but he couldn't show me any footage because this was right the summer where they had made that big decision to not do the dinosaur stop motion, to do them CG instead. And, right. and ILM is full tilt, you know, trying to solve all the problems and figure everything out. Um, but you know, his excitement for the work they were doing was, was palpable. It was obvious. And, um, but anyways, he gave me a tour. And the other thing that was cool about it is that, um, so that would have been around 92 or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they still had most, all of their pre digital era visual effects, filmmaking equipment. Oh, sweet. they had a big machine that they built themselves to um, shoot matte paintings on, right? When when they used to do these paintings on glass, yeah, yeah. create environments that weren't real. Um, and so that big camera system was still there, and I saw that. And they still had, you know, just a bunch of things like that. By the time I came back and started working at ILM in '96, so only four years later, all that stuff was gone. All those spaces were full of desks with computers on them with artists and computers. Mm -hmm. So the company had changed radically in just those four years. So I I was happy to have gotten a chance to get just a peek at the ILM that I'd grown up reading about all those years. But I got there would be actually quite different in, in in many ways in terms of technology and techniques and things. So, so, um, but where, Oh, you asked me how I got, so, uh, so I was at ILM, I mean, uh, at Pixar and, Toy Story had wrapped, and it was going to be a while before Bugs Life was starting, and they were keeping us busy with different odds and ends, this Toy Story, CD Rob, and some other things. Mm-hmm. And as much as I loved being at Pixar and was super thrilled to have been part of Toy Story and the reception that I got afterwards, of course, you know, I still really wanted to do the ILM thing. Yeah. I, I, I yearned to, be, to do what Ray Harryhausen had done more than what Walt Disney had done, right. if, if that's a way of expressing it. And of course. So it was a really difficult decision because Pixar was obviously an awesome place to be, but I, you know, I had stayed in touch with Dennis and I would talk to him periodically. And I, so I, and they were getting ready to do a second Jurassic Park film and it had been announced that George was going to do more Star Wars films, which was like mind blowing. Oh yes. I thought, you know, I got it. I got to do it. I got to send a tape over and go over there. And so now I had shots from Toy Story on my reel, which was great. And, um, so I got hired. I was hired in, uh, I think I started in July of 96 uh, as an animator on Lost World in the second Fast Park. Dude, just in time. Yeah. Do you remember what your first day at ILM was like? Yeah. Tell tell Um, me. This is a dream. Back in those days, ILM was not in, right now ILM is in the Presidio of San Francisco, which is this beautiful park-like setting. Um, But back then, from the time, okay, we go back a little further. Mm-hmm. When they did the visual effects for the first Star Wars, yeah. ILM wasn't a company. It was just the it was just the visual effects unit for the film. Mm-hmm. They rented some warehouse space in Van Nuys down in Southern California, and they did the effects for the first film. So it's a big success. And now George can move all his filmmaking operations back up to Northern California, where he prefers to work and live, where mm-hmm. he made American Graffiti and THX, et cetera. And so ILM moved up there as well to some light industrial space uh, in a town called San Rafael, which is about, I don't know, 15 minutes north of San Francisco in Marin County. Right. And so that's where ILM was when I joined in 96. Oh, Uh, okay. And so it was this collection of of light industrial buildings that they had kind of taken the lease over one after another over the years, and their campus kind of grew. Mm -hmm. And they had stage space, and they had a model shop, and a wood shop, and a machine shop, and they had all these all this space for all these desks with computers on them and, you know, all the things they needed and a screening theater and all that. Um, and so that's where I went to work that first time was at, at that location. And that to me was like, this is ILM, you know, this yeah. is where they made fire. This is where they made Jedi. This is Dragon Slayer, you know, ET, yeah. everything done here. So, um, so it was just this collection of this kind of campus of buildings. And so there was, you know, someone assigned to me as a new employee to kind of give me the tour and here's your, key card and you know yeah. at that time they had 
two portables in the parking lot, you know, like, um, like when they have portable classrooms, you know, yeah, yeah. like a, a mobile home sort of turned into a trailer office. looking thing. Yeah. I know what you mean. They had a pair of those in the, in this one courtyard. And that's where they, at that point in time, had their sort of training area for new employees that oh. they didn't quite know what desk to put them in yet, but put <laughs> sure. them in there. And, um, and so I sat in there for about a week. And the funny thing is that the day I started was the beginning of, so every year uh, in, around that time, around the end of July, beginning of August, there's a, there's a big um, convention called SIGGRAPH, and it's all about computer graphics. Oh, right it's on. Been for, for years and years, and it was going then. And it was kind of, at that time, the biggest professional event for people involved in, in computer graphics. And, and so, by extension, people involved in visual effects using computer graphics. And so, I started there the day uh, that and it was, at that year was down in LA or wherever it is. I, mm-hmm. they don't, I don't know. I haven't been there. But anyways, the, the thing is, tons of people were out that whole week. Oh, that week, <laughs> so nobody could really put me to work on anything or even really give me much guidance. It was kind of like because oh, no. <laughs> Pixar had its own um, proprietary animation software. So when I got to ILM, they were using at that time Softimage, mm-hmm. and um, and I had never used Softimage, so they were just like. Here's some training books. Uh, you just use this computer and figure it out. <laughs> let us know if you have any problems. And so I basically spent that first week. So I, I, you know, I started trying to learn, you know, where the buttons were. It was just sort of the same concepts. You know, it was just like but with different menu options and stuff. Sure. And I had some other people in the room who were a little further along with me than me that I could bud for when I had questions. Um, and then I found online. I just went looking online for some of the dinosaur assets from Lost World that were ready. So they had those little compies, the little chicken-sized dinosaurs, oh, yeah. and those were ready, and they were rigged. And so I loaded one of those in and just started animating a test with it, just to keep myself busy and interested. And sure. um, and then Randy Dutra, who was the um, animation supervisor on that film, at some point toward the end of that week came through and. I was like, hey, Randy, let me show you something. And, uh, and he was really tickled. And um, so I ended up getting crude on that on that show. And I think Randy liked that I, I had a stop motion background, too, because that was his background as well. And she sure. kind of bothered over that. And he was a great teacher on that on that project. Randy knows uh, way more than than most people will ever, ever know about animal locomotion and, you know, what what how real animals behave and move and their and their physiology and their muscle systems and all that stuff and he could apply all that knowledge to our dinosaurs which after all we were treating like animals not like monsters so right. we really wanted genuine real feeling animal behaviors and uh it was a master class uh working under randy on that film um in terms of that stuff so yeah of course. Uh, really great yeah great opportunity for me that is amazing so your first movie that you worked on at ilm was jurassic park too yeah dude that's big it was great it's what i wanted to work on of the films that were in house at the time although i I would say they were also working on men in black which i didn't know anything about until i started working there right Um, and i thought "Ooh, that looks cool (laughs) they had cool creatures and stuff but you know i really wanted to do dinosaurs and I was psyched to be on on Jurassic Park, but uh, sure. What uh, what effects did you do on Jurassic Park two? I I did um, I did that little test with the copy, but I didn't end up doing much with the copies. Uh, I think that was Miguel Fuertes was sort of in charge of them. Uh-huh. I did some shots of the Stegosaurus. What the first one where we see him crossing the stream? Yeah, right before um, and that was really more touches it. Yeah, we didn't have stegos in the first film, so it was nice to do something new and fun. Yeah. And I did – they had a big roundup scene, and so I know one of the first things I got tasked with was doing run and walk cycles of some of the different dinosaurs so that they could be plugged in to build up these big stampede shots. So I did the big Mementosaur, which is sort of a big brontosaurus-looking thing. Yeah. And the so I did something with the Pachycephalosaur, the one with the horny, boned head. Yeah, that hits the dude through the Jeep. And uh, what else? Maybe the Parasaurolophus? I forget. But a few different cycles that way. And then I moved into just specific shots, like with the Stegos. And I did a shot where Julianne Moore falls off the roof, and there's a couple of raptors fighting over her, and they roll yeah. around on the ground. And that was a lot of fun. That was kind of a complicated shot. And um, 
a lot of problems to solve. And, and I really liked, uh, like, you know, that, that, that one felt good. You know, you got to the end and you're like, ah, that was meaty. That was. Yeah. That was really... <laughs> There's the real work right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you are working on say Jurassic world two or Jurassic park two, right. You do you get raw footage of just the actor playing pretend and then you put these effects over the shot. How does yeah. that, how does that work? Yeah. So they'll have shot a scene, like for instance, that scene and, and, I wasn't there on set because right. when you're just, you know, as an animator, you don't, the, the supervisor, Randy would have been on set, you sure. know, and then he comes back and, and, um, and, you know, meanwhile, Steven or whoever, you know, in this case, Steven, but whoever the director is on a project will be off, you know, cutting their sequences together. And when they're ready, they turn them over to us and they, they run through the sequence. And so Steven would have run through the sequence with Randy and said, you know, uh, you know, Julian's here. I think there should be one raptor here and another one there. And then they just need to kind of, you know, then just make it cool. You know, make them snap at each other and fight or whatever. You know, whatever, sure. however much or as much or little direction as uh, depending on who the director is and how much they like to, you know, control that or whether they kind of let the team run with it. Every project's different in that regard. But but yes, the stuff gets shot first. It gets edited. Then it comes to us. And then we uh, there's a step called layout or match moving where um, because if we're going to render images that match in perspective and lighting and everything else to mm -hmm. the footage, we have to create a scene in the computer um, that matches the, the scene in the real world. So that makes if, sense. If there are landmarks like where the where the ground plane is, or um, in that case, we needed a rough kind of mannequin that showed us where Julianne was in 3D space. Um, and then, uh, and then we have to match the camera. So we have a CG camera that has the same, uh, focal length lens and is at the same height off the ground and the same tilt angle and pan, you know, and, and does the same movements if the camera is moving. Yeah, um, so yeah. once that's done, then that gets handed to the animator. So the animator opens their scene on the computer in this case, again, back then it was soft image. Now we use Maya, but they open their scene in the computer and they load in this, this layout scene, this match move scene. And so what they see in the computer is they see that footage, but layered over the top of it, they see these kind of simplified CG objects of the CG ground that matches the ground in the, in the footage. Sure. And the mannequin kind of roughly moving around that matches uh, where Julianne was crawling around on the ground. Now in some shots, we, there was also a sequence where um, I forget the actor's name. He's so fantastic. He was in uh, Fargo as well. Uh, the guy, anyways, the guy that gets killed by the um, the compies, they all swarm oh, all over. Yeah. So for shots like that, with that really tight interaction between the CG characters and live actor, mm -hmm. then that mannequin that we make really has to be tightly matched to the movement of the actor because we're going to attach our dinosaurs to this CG version of the character. Right. Um, in the case of my shot with Julianne, where. They're not really in contact with her. They're just sort of fighting around her. Sure. I just needed a very, uh, you know, the layout group would have just given me a very sort of roughly motion, you know, popped into position kind of mannequin that sort of does the rough move so I can judge them in 3D space. But anyway, so I get this scene and then I can, I can look at it from any angle because it's a 3D scene in the computer and I can put my dinosaurs in there and pose them the way I want them and start to block in the scene. Gotcha. Um, but so yeah, that's, that's roughly how it works. Even now, it hasn't changed at all, really. I mean, we, we that, still do. That makes sense because you would need a 3D environment that way. You don't have like raptors walking through rocks and stuff like that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You you have to know like, you know, spatially, and that's the, that's another thing I always find interesting about CG is that um, the way you animate in the computer is similar in some ways to hand drawn animation uh, because in hand drawn animation classically. You know, the animator would do these key drawings and maybe breakdown drawings, but then they'd hand it to an assistant who would do all the little in-between drawings, right, to get from sure. A to B. And so it's a little bit like the computer where, you know, you create these key poses and breakdown poses, and then the computer is your in-betweener doing these in-between. Sure. But it's also, but it, but unlike 2D animation where you're, you know, draw, making 2D drawings and you can cheat those drawings and do all kinds of interesting things, mm -hmm. it CG, you kind of have to respect the actual 3D space that you're in. And so in that way, it's more like stop motion. Where in stop motion, you've got a character that, you know, it's a puppet. Its arms are always lo only as long as they are, and his legs are only as long as they are. And you, when you make them walk and move, you have to sort of respect those, three, the 3D, the, phys the physical nature of it. Um, and so CG is a little bit like that. I mean, 
you can do things with the CG character. You can squash and stretch them and do different things that are a little bit like draw and animation. But really, you also have to kind of respect the three D world that you're in and and treat it in a three D way. Especially now with so many movies being released in three D as well as two D. Yeah, for real. The more imperative that you not cheat things and do weird things that only look good from one camera angle. You have to sort of make things legal and, and actually, you know, real in a 3d space. So sure. Sure. And with higher definition, you can't get away with anything. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's, and you know, that's all, you know, the resolution's gone up. We're getting into high dynamic range exposure, mm-hmm. higher frame rate, all that stuff um, is, is making our job, Harder. <laughs> oh, okay. it's, sure, you know, sure. But by but, getting faster, so it helps. And, yeah, of course. And and as quickly as you're learning, it's incredible that you're even keeping up with the pace of technology. You guys are just amazing. But so you do, you do Jurassic Park two, and then yep. we'll, we'll flash forward a couple of years, and dude, you're working on Star Wars. Yeah. What? Well, that was the, I think that was the very next thing I did was Phantom Menace. Yeah. I for the record, I adore the prequels, like everything about them. <laughs> That's and, awesome. Like, awesome I am prequel defense force captain, and episode one specifically. I was uh, I was born in ninety one, so I was eight years old when it happened. And Perfect. Qui Gon Jinn's my favorite character in all of Star Wars. Like, I'm, awesome. I'm die hard man. <laughs> so that's great. You're work, you, you're this kid that sent in a letter to Star Wars, had a sequel idea. Flash forward a bunch of years, you're working at ILM on Star Wars: The Resurgence, like the biggest premiere ever. Yeah, dude. What? First off, that's amazing. Secondly, uh, this was your first time working with George Lucas, I'm assuming. Yep. How was yep. that? It was my boy. It was great. George is awesome. He's very enthusiastic about Star Wars. Um, still to this day, but you know, then especially he very engaged. You could ask him, um, "Hey, George, you know, we've got this new pod racer that we haven't animated before. We're just doing starting to do the first scene with you know Ben Quadraneros or whoever." Yeah. And um, so what's this guy's story? What's what's his deal? And George would just, without pausing, just launch right into, well, he's a space pirate or whatever. You know, I forget what Ben's backstory sure. was. But, you know, George would just launch into a description. And the great thing was that you, there was no way to tell whether he could do that because he had already thought it through and he'd written out a backstory <laughs> for that character. Or if he was just making it up on the spot. It didn't matter. It was still cool. Yeah, it was great. It's, it's and either George. way. And, and, <laughs> Yeah, and his enthusiasm was was awesome. So, um, yeah, I, I loved it. It was that definitely was not one of those. Oh, you finally get to meet one of your heroes, and it turns out to be kind of a jerk or something. No, he was he was great. Sure, and especially because he seemed like the kind of person who was very. He was always uh, like I remember watching the, this thing on him a bunch of years ago where he said that it is he feels that it is our job uh, to adopt technology early and learn it and get it going to push it forward into the future. So he was always the next level uh, in yeah. tech and stuff like that. And then episode one comes out, and it's incredible. Like, you're so far ahead of everything. And he seems like the kind of guy who's very into visual effects, who's very into I mean, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, he he started um, Edit Droid because he wanted to – you know, a, sort of an electronic nonlinear editing system, yeah. which which later became Avid. And he started the computer, the Lucasfilm Computer Graphics Group, because he wanted to exploit computer graphics in filmmaking. He didn't want them making <laughs> animated yeah. films. And so that's why once he got the technology that he was looking for, that's why he sold them to Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs created Pixar out of them. And, and they Crazy. became Pixar. But, um, but George is... Thing was I, I want the technology to help me make movies i, I don't want to own, own an animation company i just want to but you know then flash forward a few more years and we have lucas animation but that's yeah of but course. That's perfect. <laughs> you um, can't, can't help when you create the next thing yeah. but he was always you know and then T, he starts thx to improve theater sound and he's so he's always uh interested in film technology but only in, in as much as it could help him do what he wanted to do with movies. It wasn't just technology for technology's sake. It yeah, was of course. <laughs> he, he had problems he wanted solving. And, and that's why ILM was important to him because ILM could solve these problems. And once they'd done Jurassic Park, he was like, okay, I think we're, we're ready to do um, more Star Wars movies. So. Yeah, it's go time. Did, yeah. did you work on Jar Jar at all? <laughs> you know, that's it, next I, level, it, man. 
I did not animate uh, even one Jar Jar shot. I got so Rob Rob Coleman was the uh, animation director on all three of the prequels. Yeah. Rob is one of the nicest people in the whole uh, movie industry. Cool. He's he's an absolutely lovely guy. Um, we're still good friends. I just saw him about a week ago. He came through town. He lives in Australia now. Um, he's been directing animation, directing these uh, like Lego Batman and, and oh, right like, on. Yeah, he's super talented. He's a nice, nice guy in the world. Anyways, but he was the animation director then, okay. and he gave me a shot at being a character lead on on Phantom Menace. Okay. So my, my next little bump up from regular animator to animation lead. And so one of my tasks was um, Boss Nass, the what king of the Gungans. So oh my god, I, I didn't do any Jar Jar shots, but I did. I, I was the lead on Boss Nass. Did a bunch of the shots, um, and what? and then sort of kept an eye on the other shots with, with Rob, you know, being the ultimate arbiter and, uh, and George above him. But so that was really fun. And then, so there was one shot toward the end of the movie where boss Ness and Jar Jar walk are walking along and, and boss Ness has his arm around yes, Jar Jar makes him general. Right. Exactly. And we were, it was t- way toward the end of the schedule and we, and it was a really long shot and we needed to get it done as quickly as we could so we ended up splitting the shot. I did Boss Nass, and this animator, uh, Lou Delrosa, a really talented animator, Lou did Jar Jar. So even in that shot, even though I worked on that shot, mm-hmm. I, did, I didn't do Jar Jar. <laughs> Dude, so I could take credit for no Jar Jar shots. Dude, that counts. First off, I love Jar Jar. I'm going to say it as well. Right. Big fan. Awesome. Big, big fan. Uh, and so you've done these animations, and Jar Jar was like a huge thing, and Boss Nass as well, because you've got an actual actor on set, and you're – animating a character over the person as opposed to having the actor and the effect next to it or around it. Right. Like, how difficult was that to turn a person that you're getting footage of into an alien with no, like, prosthetics? Like, I know Ahmed Best had, like, a little Jar Jar face on his head and then, like, right. sunglasses. Would look up where the eyes are, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, Boss Nass, what goes into that effect? Um... You know, we had great reference of Brian Blessed. Now, unlike Jar Jar, there wasn't a Boss Nass actor. Like, Brian Blessed did the voice. Really? I but, didn't know um, this. Yeah. So, in fact, Jar Jar was really the only CG character in that film where there was an actor there, the whole, you know what I mean, playing him on set oh, that everyone could look at. Okay. Whereas with Boss Nass, he was more like a traditional animated character where you had an actor do the voice. Right, And right, we right. had a video of Brian... Um, Recording is his the voice part, but he was you know like they do really with any animated film. He was at a he was in a little sound studio at a lectern with his you know reading glasses on right. or whatever script in front. Of him. So he wasn't physically acting out all these parts. Oh, okay. Um, but still, just watching him, watching how his face worked and and maybe hand gestures that he made and things like that. So that was all useful to us, and we could kind of mine that for ideas. But basically, it was just we kind of made him up out of nothing. I didn't and, know that. And I don't know where the, you know, he has this tick that he does where he goes. Oh, yes. And I don't know where that came from. I don't know. <laughs> it came from if Brian. That was a script or if that was, <laughs> if George said, yeah, I want you to do this. Or if that was some ad lib that Brian did and George went, oh, that's awesome. I have no idea where that came from. But I when we it's the last one. <laughs> the thing we did with him and it's in the audio and we're getting the turnover from George. <laughs> Rob's just like, what is George? What is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. It's tick. It's an affectation. So it's um, it's how was, you know he means business. That's what it that's is. Right. That's right. <laughs> that's but crazy. Yeah, great. And I, I did. I was the lead on him, and then on the um, droidic cars. The, the what we call them destroyer droids. The yes. rolling rolling. And so those were really cool. I like those a lot. I'm, I'm a big. I love robots. My office is full of tin robots and robots sure. of all. Oh, and we'll get there. That comes full circle. <laughs> Dude, that's crazy, because I always wondered about that. And uh, uh, so episode one, it, it wraps up. You get it done. You worked on the pod races, you said? Um, No, I didn't. You didn't? Uh, Boss Nass was like I, your guy. I was using, I was using Ben as, a, as an example. But, oh, of course. Uh, I don't think I – I did some – I did a little bit of stuff with the pit droids. Like I did a run oh, cycle with sweet. pit droids and some other stuff. But I don't think I did any actual – no, I didn't animate any um, pod racing shots. I did some shots of Watto. 
What? Uh, Linda Bell was the Linda Bell was the lead character lead on Watto, and um, and I got assigned a few shots of Watto, like when he says, you know, I'm a toy dairy, and my tricks don't work on me, only, only mine. Money. Oh yes, <laughs> dude, what? That is so oh. cool. You'll find that I'm gonna I'm gonna get more freak outy as we go. <laughs> like I said, I'm obsessed. Uh, wow, that is incredible. So uh, so at the end of this, um, that letter that you wrote. Oh comes, yeah, uh, comes a little full circle. Yeah, we had a we had a crew breakfast to celebrate the wrap, and George was there. And as the breakfast was kind of finishing up, a couple of people kind of sheepishly came over with, you know, Phantom Menace posters, which were by that time already out, mm-hmm. or or other Star Wars related stuff to ask George if he'd sign it. You know, which is something nobody would ever do. Yeah, of course. Working because you know we're working. Yes, yeah. unless you're John Boyega. Day. This was kind of a celebratory moment, and George was very sweet. He, he, he was fine, and so a little cue started to form. And um, Rob Coleman actually came over to me. He goes, you got to get that. He'd seen the letter. I had it actually, By that point, I had it framed. Oh, yeah, of <laughs> by, course. Yeah, to. Desk. you got to get that letter and bring it over here. I was like, no. I said, yeah, go get it. So <laughs> I went and got it, and um, I pulled it out of the frame, and I handed it to George, and he, and he read it. And he kind of chuckled. And so the part of the letter that said, you know, getting into Hollywood takes a combination of talent and luck. He underlined talent and luck and wrote, you have it, and, and signed. Dude. So that was like the closing of the circle, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Things are just meant. That is yeah. incredible. So from there, you uh, you worked on the Pirates movies. Yeah. Which were amazing. Yeah, I got, um, right after Phantom Menace, I got my first chance to be the animation supervisor on AI, yes. artificial intelligence. It's too sad. And then, too sad. And then it's very sad. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then after that, worked on Attack of the Clones, and Rob uh, kind of had me and this uh, other guy, Chris Armstrong, as sort of under soups, like a junior soups on that. And then he kind of parceled out parts of the work. Just And Rob was great about putting Chris and I in front of George when we were presenting our sequences, which was great. So we got Sweet. a lot of faith time work. And I learned a lot about presenting work and being a supervisor and managing a team from from Rob actually. So sure. anyway, so there was that. And then and then so then I was from that point on I was supervising. Um, and then yeah, in, along the way came the first Pirates film, uh, Pir- the, the Black Pearl um, yep. Curse of the Black Pearl. Black Pearl. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so that was my first time working with Gore Verbinski, and that was awesome, and we got along great. And it was also my first chance to work directly with John Knoll. John and I had would chat around work, and I felt like we had a shared sensibility, and we kind of crossed paths a little bit on the prequels, but not very directly. Sure. Uh, and and uh, Black Pearl was the first time. And so John was the effects soup, and I was the anim soup, and... We got along great, and we've done, I don't know, six or seven movies together now. But so that, you know, was the first Pirates, and then Dead Man's Chest, and, and uh, The World's End. And so, and I, I, did, I haven't worked on uh, four or five, or what are we up to now, five? I haven't worked on I, I didn't work on either of those. Sure. But, um, but yeah, so yeah, Pirates was ended up being really great. It was, a, it was a great partnership with Gore, and I really liked the movies. And, and sure. Really and uh, yeah. I know you're not going to say it, so I'm going to. That second one... You uh, you did so well. Yeah, uh, dude, you won an Oscar. We did. Yes. What do you no, realize how all, big this is? Really <laughs> yeah. Like I get, I get you're being humble, and I appreciate that. <laughs> but dude, you're an Oscar winner. You won an Oscar for the thing that you always wanted to do. As a kid, you're like, I'm gonna do VFX. Is what, I, and it led up to literally the highest honor in the movie industry. Yeah, it was what? it was exciting. Yeah, super, it's super okay. Rewarding. I mean, if you're into that kind of stuff, <laughs> yeah, it's <is> alright, <laughs> dude. What? So, what? So I, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. So you won it for the second one, Dead Man's yep. Chest, and that was with Bill Nye and uh, Davy Jones. Yeah. And that was a guy who was there on set that you animated over, correct? Yeah. How now, how do you attack that? How do you mean like this is Bill Nye and we're gonna make him have an octopus face? Well, we had done, uh, you know, the first Pirates, where the gag there was that these Pirates are cursed, and when they go out in the moonlight, they turn into skeletons. Yes. And so we had a bunch of shots on that film where we either had to start with a live actor and end the shot with a skeleton, or we had shots with, for instance, uh, I don't know, Orlando Bloom sword fighting against a skeleton, let's say. Yes. 
And the way a shot like that would be tackled on the on the first film was you'd shoot the scene once with Orlando and a stunt performer doing the choreography. Mm-hmm. And then you would shoot the scene again with Orlando just fighting against air. And really? Hopefully, hopefully doing a good job. And he was quite good at it, but hopefully doing a good job of repeating the choreography and doing it in a way that felt like he was really fighting against someone. Sure. And the idea is that wherever possible, you would use the f- piece of footage that had him fighting against nothing. Sure. Because that way then you could put in the skeleton fighting him uh, and you wouldn't have to remove the stunt performer, which right. was extra work, right? Of course. On occasion, there were shots where the take with him fighting a real person just was so much better that it was worth going through the extra effort of, of painting the guy out, the stunt guy and putting it in. But basically that was the, the idea. Right. And we wanted the skeleton characters in that film to have as realistic a motion as possible. So what we wanted to use on that film was motion capture, right? Which you've seen where the actors in the gray suit with the little ball, reflective balls all over it. And yeah, the capture on the stage. The problem is that, um, especially at that time, motion capture was only done on a specialized motion capture stage where you've got all these little cameras, like, you know, a ton of them all around the studio mm-hmm. to capture the movement of those little markers. Right. It was, not, it was not something you could do on a movie set without totally slowing everything down. Sure. Right? Making, you know, you just, and you just couldn't do that. So we'd shoot these scenes and, and Orlando would pretend to fight somebody who wasn't there. And then later we'd, motion capture an actor on a stage doing the other half of the choreography. Mm-hmm. And then we apply that motion to our CG skeleton and put it in the scene and then have to make a ton of adjustments so that the swords actually appeared to clash and the time right and all stuff. And it just wasn't ideal. I mean, yes, we got realistic looking motion because it was motion capture, mm-hmm. but it would be so much better if, for instance, that stunt performer that was fighting against Orlando if we had a way of tracking his motion, but a way that didn't slow down production and require all this special equipment and all these little cameras so that we could do it anywhere. We could do it on the cave, the treasure cave set, but we could do it in the jungle. We could do it on a ship, wherever. So that was our task with the um, second film because we knew we had this 100% CG character that was there all the time, not just in the moonlight, Davy Jones and his crew, and we wanted – super realistic motion, and we really wanted a great actor to author that performance. Sure. Not just somebody on a motion capture stage, but a great actor, in this case, Bill Nighy. Mm-hmm. And we really wanted Bill to do his work face-to-face with Johnny and everyone else, not right. on a motion capture stage at a separate time, talking to a green tennis ball or something. Um, so that forced us to come up with what we, at that time, called iMocap, just basically because we needed a name for it that was different from sure. regular mocap. And um, and so we came up with this different kind of suit that had these sort of checkered bands on it instead of the little retroflective markers. And instead of having dozens of tiny cameras fixed around a set, we just had a couple of video cameras that we could plop down kind of anywhere mm-hmm. right, right as the scene was getting ready to, to start. Uh, as long as we weren't in the way or blocking a light or you know something, we could put these little cameras down and we could capture the motion. And it wasn't as clean or high fidelity as what you get on a motion capture stage. Mm-hmm. But it was definitely good enough to capture what we needed. Um, and then the actors could do their job where they should do it, which is with all the other actors reacting to each other. And, you sure. know, the magic happens on set. So that was the birth of that. And that's become widespread in the industry now. Um, WET has done great things with on-location motion capture for the, in their Apes films. Oh, yeah. Uh, for instance. But, you know, we – and they, and they also um, – you know, they were trying to solve the same problems at that time with – at the time we were doing, uh, you know, the first and second um, Pirates of the Caribbean films. You know, they were doing the – these. they had done already some of the Lord of the Rings films. Yeah. And were on their way to finishing the third, I think, by then. But, uh, 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 you know, they had similar problems to solve with Gollum. So they were working on a lot of these same problems. Sure. Um, but, so that was our path to it. And so that's how we came up with this system. And um, – we didn't want to also tackle facial capture at that time. We had enough problems. We had to do <laughs> sure. with, with body capture, trying to do that on set. And then also we had this whole problem with Davy Jones' tentacle beard and mm-hmm. how we were to solve that problem. So we didn't do uh, facial capture. That's come along since then. But, um, but uh, So we had to animate his face completely by hand 
but we would study Bill's performance intensely, you know, down to the tiniest fraction of movement of an eyebrow or an eyelid. Sure, we a little nuance. If you look at it. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so that was the job on that. And, and then it was him, and then it was, you know, like a dozen of his crew as well. So sure. Quite, wow. quite a big change. So the the original mocap suits, you said they had, like, reflector balls on them. And then yeah. when it went on and it evolved to, like, these stripes and whatnot, what e- what exactly are those stripes doing? Are they giving you, like, this goes here, and you just kind of, like, Velcro, for lack of a better term, you just Velcro the animation onto that marker, and it'll kind of move with them? Kind of, yeah. I mean, basically, we wanted to have markers on the actors that uh, provided symbols that were of a known dimension and shape, you know, squares, triangles, circles, Uh and on a material that was sort of dimensionally stable. In other words, if you just printed that on the fabric, it would stretch and wrinkle and things like that. But these bands were kind of a flexible plastic, and Mm -hmm. so they... um, once they were attached to the costume, the little symbols on them didn't distort um, so that you could look at a piece of footage with this character with these bands on and track their motions optically um, much better than if they were just, you know, in normal clothes. And uh, again, not quite as faithfully as, as this, you know, a motion capture stage where you've got dozens of little cameras seeing all these little points of light, but still pretty good. And, and our motion capture are on set eye mocap suits have evolved over the years. The ones we use now look super different than the ones we had. Uh, like, for instance, if you look at footage of uh, Alan Tudyk, behind the scenes footage of Alan Tudyk from oh, Rogue yeah. One, the suit he's wearing has really totally different markers and things. And that's just because we've learned as we've gone along and made changes to it and stuff. But the ones we had on Pirates were uh, basically just these black and white bands that were kind of on every movable part of the body. So, you know, Wrist, elbow, upper arm, shoulder, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, sure. That is crazy. So you guys have always been like right on the precipice of the next thing, developing technology that like isn't even here yet. That's bonkers. So you that's get, the that's you, the most fun, you know. If, yeah. if you have a project where you, that you're kind of like, yeah, we pretty much know how to do this work, it's sort of boring. <laughs> sure. No, that's it's that's. Like, that's... Boy, I have no idea how we're going to do this. That's that's a lot more fun. That is nuts. I like. I am amazed. The all of you guys are just magicians to me. And then <laughs> the idea that you like hand animated Davy Jones's face, and then you had the mocap for the body, and this was after Jar Jar. So to think, Jar Jar, you have a guy there who's not wearing all of those stripes and all those like he's not wearing a reflective ball suit, and yep. you still came through, and it that is. Wow, you know, one one day I'm gonna come to I'm gonna come to Lucasfilm and I'm just gonna shake everyone's hand and be like, thank you, thank you, thank you, and hold me to this because it's recorded now. All of it. That is insane. So you you do this and then you end up at you end up nominated. So where are you gonna you end up nominated for an Oscar, and yeah. the Oscars is not something everyone, even in the industry, even people that are good in the industry gets to experience. So you're there. And then, and then you win. What what was that night like? Uh, it was every bit of as awesome as you kind of would hope. Like you know, what I mean, like nothing bad happened. We didn't. It's not like we <laughs> won, but then, we, but then our limo got in a crash, and you know something. Right. Like, it was great. And the weather was great. Um, we and the thing is, so we we were nominated for the first Pirates film, but that yeah. year we knew we were not going to win because. Uh, Return of the King was up, and everybody knew they were not just going to win every Oscar. They were going to win everything. <laughs> they won they everything that year that they were nominated for. Yep. Um, so we knew. And so, in a way, it was more relaxing. It was like, hey, this is awesome. We get to go to the Oscars. We don't even have to worry about it because we know we're not going to win. We'll just, you know, it'll be fun. When Second Pirates was nominated, it was a bit more of a horse race that year. I think we were up against Poseidon and Superman, uh, Man of Steel, maybe, mm-hmm. I think. And um, and back then there were only three nominees for the visual effects category. Now there are five. Yeah. Um, but it was a little more like, well, we could win. And so that was way more nerve wracking. Like in the month or so between the announcement of the nominations and the actual Oscars night, it kind of you have to work hard to not let it completely obsess you. Your sure. Brain. And I what I did, I had a little game I played with myself where I would force myself to imagine not winning. <laughs> um, 
so that so that it was would be less of a shock. Like I would actually rehearse that moment in sure, my head, sure. where they call out Superman or Poseidon or whatever, and not think. And then every now and then, as a reward, I would allow myself the fun of imagining, you know, well, what if we did win though? What sure. That be like? But I wouldn't do that constantly because I just thought that's a recipe for being for cr- like crushing myself. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You, pr- um, you practice so then, your fake clap for the other people. You're yeah, like, be and then we went, and, and they called our names when the big moment came, and then it was all about just not tripping over myself when we, <laughs> you know, getting up onto the stage, and John was our designated spokesman, and... Uh, you got your words in, though. You got your words in. I, I did. I got a shout-out to my son in the, in the few final seconds, and uh, it was great. And then, you know, uh, Charlie Gibson, who was one of our, our four of, of, in our group uh, who won for that film, he had won previously for Babe, the first Babe film, and... Oh, yes. uh, and so he told me beforehand, he said, look, if we win, uh, when, when we're, you know, after the awards, just when you get back out to your hired car, just tell them to take you to one of the parties. Because if you've got a, if you won, they'll, they'll let you in. <laughs> you just pull so out we're, your we're, Oscar. I'm good, right? Yeah. <laughs> we finished up. We got back to the car and we said, we, the driver said, what do you want to do? And we said, take us to the Vanity Fair party, which there you go. at that time was still at Morton's and is, I think, still pretty much the top party to go to yeah, of, yeah. Of the parties. Uh, but then it was still at Morton's, which was kind of the old haunt for it, which was cool. And so they took us over there and they were super nice. They were like, thank you so much for coming to our park. Please come right in. And, and we had a, an absolutely magnificent evening. I had, I took, I had a little, you know, instamatic, not instamatic, but you know, <laughs> that's super old fashioned, but a little, mm-hmm. uh, it, this was before everybody was snapping pictures with their phones. So every, sure. back then everybody had, these, you know, very small little, you know, digital cameras. Uh, I forget what brand it was, but I had one of those in my pocket and I was just constantly taking people's picture all night. And because I had that golden idol in my hand. <laughs> because you had the key to the city. <laughs> yeah, people were super nice in that. In fact, you'd have like ridiculously famous people coming up and saying, can I hold that? And you just think to yourself, smart, smart. you must be over this by now. I mean, look at you, you're, you know, whoever. And and they were just, they loved it. They were just like, take my picture with it. I'm like, okay, I'll take your picture with it. <laughs> Dude, I would have done the exact same thing, let's be honest. It was an awesome evening. Is it, awesome. is it heavy? It is. They're great. They're exactly the weight they seem like they ought to be. Like you pick it up and you go, ooh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know this, what I mean? This like, was earned. <laughs> yeah, nobody has ever picked one of those up, I don't think, and gone, eh, it feels a little cheap. It's like, yeah. no, they, whatever. <laughs> It's almost like they focus group tested it. Like, I don't think they That's did, right. but it's just, it's just exactly what you kind of want it to be in terms of weight and solidness and everything. It's yeah. C- it's because it's, it's full of all the crushed dreams. They still have, they have to rent new space every year for all the crushed dreams. That's right. They, you know, <laughs> they, they melt, them, they melt them down, put in gold dye, and that's what this really is. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Dude, that's, that's incredible. So you do that, you, you win an Oscar, flash forward a couple of years, your buddy John Knoll gets an idea to pitch this little movie Yes. about uh, about some rebels, yep. and then you find yourself working uh, on the precipice of new tech again in Rogue One. Yeah, I made him crew me on the show. I mean, we'd, we'd already <laughs> done a bunch of films together, but, but I was just like, he told me about the movie, I'm like, John, if they make this movie, I ha- I mean... I'm work. I'm gonna work on it. You can't stop me from working. <laughs> I would have done the same thing. Hey, man, we both have Oscars, all right. So <laughs> that means was... I'm riding your coattails everywhere. <laughs> Just... it, it really tickled me that you know one of our own had had conceived the film and you know. Was yeah, gonna have... I love that. Absolutely really? love that. And that's like one of my favorite things about like Lucasfilm specifically is that the people that are making the stuff now are actually fans of the stuff. Oh, absolutely! Like I yeah. think that, I think that's the most important because when you find someone like uh, like a big actor and you're like, oh, this is great. I don't want to name anyone. Here's their board. That's like, oh, you know, it's a job. It's, you know, it's whatever. <laughs> you're like, this thing means a lot to me. <laughs> and so yeah. when you get like, dude, one of your own, a guy from the VFX department, incredible, incredible dude, comes up with like one of my all time favorite Star Wars movies. Like Rogue One was amazing. So yeah. how how cool is that? I, I loved it. I mean, A, I'm super happy with the film now that it's done. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing. All, yeah. 
But, um, and, you know, as I said, it really tickled me that, that, that the idea of the film came from John, and that, that really meant a lot to me. Sure. Um, so just kind of on every level, I, I dug it. And then, you know, it takes place minutes before the events of New Hope, which makes it, which puts it, you know, in the sweetest of spots for it me does. in terms of nostalgia and what got me, you know, excited about this stuff in the first place and all that. So, yeah, it was I mean, it was uh, honestly, it was just the best of all possible worlds for me. Um, I just, I loved it. I had the best time. I liked, really liked working with Gareth Edwards. Um, Alan Tudyk was awesome. Like yes. just every every part of it. There really was no no downside, except for Anthony Daniels. That guy, what a <laughs> jerk! No, he was. He's the sweetest guy. He's just absolutely the sweetest guy. And I was lucky enough to be because as the animation supervisor. Um, there's a certain amount of time I am on set when they're shooting stuff that we're going to be putting characters what? in. But I don't have to be there like the visual effects supervisor is there on a film like that where so much of it is visual effects. They're there pretty much the entire – like John was in England the whole time the movie was shooting, whereas I would go over there for a week and come back and I'd go over for two more weeks and come back. But sure. I was really happy to be there uh, the day they shot Anthony's uh, cameo. It was what? Just, I, I thought there's Anthony Daniels in the suit next to R2-D2. Dude. To the app. Oh, my God. Dude. It's just like completely seized. I'm just like seizing up. You know? Oh, same. It's like I need something to cover my eyes. I'm just going to start crying. Like, yeah, exactly. Do you, do you realize how amazing this is that like a kid who wrote a letter about the idea of a Star Wars sequel is on the set of Star Wars? Yeah. No, it was – and it was my first opportunity to do that because – on the prequels, I wasn't supervising. Well, like I said, I was kind of under supervising on clones, but I didn't end up working on Revenge because uh, by then I was working on Pirates, so I didn't work on Revenge. Right. I wasn't working on. I think I was working on Dreamcatch. I forget, but um, I, I didn't work on it. Uh, and but so there wasn't, you know, if uh, Rob Coleman would go and be the animation presence on set, and there was no reason for. Chris or I, or certainly any of the animators to go. So Rogue was, yeah, it was my first opportunity to get to go and, you know, climb the ladder of a X-Wing and, Dude. you know, make everybody's way geeking out on all I'm so, I'm, I am so glad to hear that. Like, you're, you're one of us, Hal. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> that oh, is, absolutely. That is amazing. And then K2. K2 is your baby. Yeah. How, yeah, yeah. And like I said, I love robots and droids, so yes, full getting circle. to make them. To make a, a Star Wars droid, you know, was was awesome. Sure, yeah. and one of the best Star Wars droids. I have a, I have a little K two. Uh, it's like a metal Disney titanium yeah. figure, and he's yeah. sitting above my desk, looking down at me. <laughs> great, got, yeah, those are nice. Yeah, I got, dude. those are great. I like those a lot. He's so cool, and Alan Tudyk's amazing. I'm a giant Firefly fan. Yeah, and I was like, oh my god, he's in Star Wars now, and he's the yeah. best droid. So how did how did K two change? Because I know, like any any movie like this, they go through a lot of iterations. Yeah. So, like from what we've seen on screen to how he originally was, how, how did that how did that path go? I out? mean, he, he as a character, he was always present, even in John's first like outline. That, mm -hmm. that part of the team was always this uh, reprogrammed uh, Imperial droid. But back then, I think people were thinking of him as being uh, sort of the Imperial version of of C three PO, like okay. that. That R2 unit we've seen that's, uh, I forget what his number is, but the one that uh, is an Imperial, it is black. That, that was oh, yeah, 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 okay. Briefly in Rogue One. I think people thought that K would be something like that. So he'd look a bit like a protocol droid, but he'd be black and have the Imperial emblem on it. So. Sure. And I, I don't know at what point that shifted, whether it was Gareth's involvement or if it had started even before that. But there was quite a long uh, exploration in the art department under Doug Chang of doing a ton of different exploratory designs for him. Mm -hmm. um, and then Gareth, I think, was the one who really pushed it toward being taller and more slim and also having a lot of uh, negative space that really told you that uh, this isn't a guy in a suit, this is a machine, and that was sure. something I think Gareth really liked. So that's kind of the evolution, at least, of the look of it. And then, you know, at some point along the way, uh, uh, you know, Alan was cast, and, and then Alan brought ideas to it in terms of the voice and what kind of voice that he does, and and that started to gel really well with what what had already been written at that point in terms of his lines and his attitude and his sense of humor oh, or yeah. correct humor he was bringing to the film, and so uh, it all just kind of 
gelled. Sure. That's, <laughs> yeah. So how had the mocap suit evolved up to this point? Um, well, so we do that like Davy Jones, we had a humanoid character that was roughly humanish size. Mm-hmm. And so for that reason, we were going to want to use an onset capture technique so that Alan could be on set with the other actors. The problem was that K2 is over seven feet tall yeah. and, Alan, and Alan isn't. And we knew that if we were going to have Alan out there on set, uh, we could have just had Alan in you know normal shoes at his normal height and put something on his head, kind of like they did with Jar Jar, to sort right. of tell the actors, hey, look up here. These are really his eyes. But we thought it would be better if we were really going to capture his movements and use them, which was the plan, uh, to find a way to get him up to the right height and give him those long legs that K2 has so that his gait and his whole you know, style of walking and everything would be correct for someone that tall with legs that long. So mm-hmm. uh, Neil Scanlon's group, who did, who's sort of the creature shop for the, the modern Star Wars films over in uh, Pinewood, uh, figured out these stilts for Alan to wear. And they're a little bit like those painter stilts that like drywall guys wear, except a lot more sophisticated. They sourced these uh, ankles that were for, I guess, for prosthetics. They're, they're motorized, but they have sensors in them so that when the foot lifts off the ground, it will lift the toe slightly uh, so you don't have to lift the foot artificially high to keep it from catching on things. And they'll adjust for angle of the terrain and that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, and then they also found these uh, really lightweight, super lightweight, flexible ski boots. They're still hard like a, like a ski boot, not like a, a snowboarding boot or, or a, a cross-country boot. Sure. But much lighter and slimmer than uh, regular, the regular ski boots people are used to seeing. And so they mounted those on the top of these extensions so that Alan's foot could be held rigidly in there. But then at the bottom where this artificial foot was on the ground, that's where it had this uh, motorized ankle. And they were terrific. Alan got in them and was just immediately looked at ease and natural in them and, uh, you know, didn't look clumsy or wobbly and, uh, and uh, really, really worked like gangbusters. And so then we were able to capture him, you know, taking these long strides like he really should be. And if, uh, you know, Jan is looking up at him, she's really looking up into Alan's eyes and they're reacting to each other. And uh, so it was great. It really worked well. Sure, sure. Which, which, uh, which version of him was harder to animate over? Him on the stilts or him with the backpack? Uh, the backpack is harder because there you're sort of tracking him, but you know you're going to really heavily modify what you've tracked because it's not in the right position and the feet aren't in the right place and all that stuff. So we would only use the backpack if we absolutely had to. Like it was used in Jordan where they were up on some rocks and it would have been dangerous for Alan to be up there on the <laughs> stilts on top of rocks. If, if he took a fall, it would have been bad. Sure. Um, but in almost every other place, I mean, again, there were a few exceptions along the way, but wherever we possibly could, we'd have them in the stilts because it just made everything better. That makes sense. That makes sense. One of my favorite parts in Rogue One was when he backhands Cassian. He's yeah. Like, and there's a fresh one if you mouth off again. Yeah. And, the, and the, the backhand, I think that was uh, Diego's idea because I think they had some – they had some thing where I think he had a he had a little mark on his face from some previous part of action that then <laughs> that then what wasn't in the going to be in the cut anymore or something. I forget the yeah, actual announcement, but I'm pretty sure that Diego came up with the idea of getting backhanded. But Alan ad lived the line, uh, and there's another one if you mouth off again. And if you look carefully at Diego after right after Alan has smacked him, uh, Diego raises his hand up to the part of his face where he just got hit. But what he's doing is he's covering his face because he's starting to crack up. Yeah. He's starting to... <laughs> and you can actually see it if you look carefully right when he does that. There's a slight little smile. That's, yeah, so, that's so smiling. funny. And it's great because it actually works in the scene. If, if you do notice it, it almost is like he's laughing in spite of himself even though they're... I mean, you yeah, know what I mean? It makes it sense with, with, it. with their relationship. Yeah. Dude, Rogue well, One was so good. Well, yeah, I, well I really... I love it. Thank you. Well done. And speaking of well done in Rogue One, correct me if I'm wrong, the the Vader scene was not originally in it from the start. Correct. How late? Where, so where was the movie at the time that the Vader scene got put in? When they're like, all right, we're going to put this scene right. in. How far along was the movie at that time? Um, it's pretty far along. I mean, they were prepping the reshoots, which, you know, there were always reshoots as if you 
read every here, there, and everywhere. There are always reshoots scheduled. Yeah, every reshoot probably expanded some because of changes along the way and you know decisions sure. that were made about what what they wanted in the third act. But still, they they were always planned for. But anyway, so the they were prepping for the reshoots, and Jabez, one of the uh, one of the two editors at the time, uh, Colin was one, and Jabez was the other. And Jabez um, pitched that scene. He said, "Look, I think." I mean, I wasn't there, but but what I, I know he pitched it. So I imagine him saying something like, you know, look, we we need to have Vader needs to get involved. He can't just be on his Star Destroyer watching this happen and then chase after Leia at the end. Sure. And um, and you know, everybody said everybody, I, I guess, being Kathy and right, yeah, <laughs> basically. Uh, but they said, yeah, that's and so they added it to the the reshoots um, and. Uh, and so that was, you know, quite late, really. It was, you know, just ahead of the, the reshoots. And, but not so – I mean, you know, they had to have time to construct the the corridor set and all that, get yeah, that all together. But, but you know, it was, it was quite late in the game for something like that. But it's, you know, it's so awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, you talk to anyone, that's like one of the highlights of the movie. So yeah. they have to shoot it and have it all done, and then it gets to you guys. So, right. like, yep. how rushed were you from the time of the release to, like, oh, by the way, here's this whole other scene, and there's a ton of special effects in it? I, you know, I mean, that was one more thing to do, and it, and it added to the work. But honestly, um, I would say just generally the changes in the third act uh, caused us to have to kind of backload the effects more than maybe we had planned for. But okay. it, ha- it happens a lot. I mean, it, sure. it wasn't like that film was, like, the worst example of that ever for any of us. It was just, uh, it was just a, you know, it was tricky and there were a lot of moving parts. And, um, but I would say the harder thing was the, uh, space battle because really, since, well, because since the, uh, the narrative pieces of what was happening on the ground with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Jude and Cassian and K2 and the rest of the rebels and, and what they're doing down there and how they're getting from A to B and where they're getting the plants for them and where the communications towers, that, those were all things that changed. Right. Okay. And so because that stuff was changing, it meant that when and where we would cut back up to Radis and the fleet sure. was changing and what those beats needed to be to push the story along. And so, um, some of that stuff just had to wait a little bit for other things to gel. And, and so I would say that was, for me, that was the most challenging aspect of, uh, of the changes that did occur in the third act was the space battle by far. Other yeah. things like having the Vader scene added, you know, it, it, it makes more work for us, but honestly those scenes from a visual effects standpoint, um, weren't as huge. I mean, we had to do lightsaber and a bunch of other tricky patching and different things and wire removals for the guy who goes up into the ceiling and things like that. Sure. But it wasn't, uh, the space battle was a lot more work <laughs> to pull together and figure out and make sure it was serving the story and that it was fitting in with the rest of the changes that were happening on the ground. So, um, but yeah, but it was all, you know, it's good, challenging work. Yeah. You, I mean, you did it. Well done. <laughs> that, that's actually uh, what you brought up something that, I, that I've always wondered what goes into a lightsaber effect because I've seen a ton of fan films and I've seen a ton of stuff online where like people have recreated it but it never quite looks like the movie what, you know, you, what sells a lightsaber effect I can't tell you Not, and, and I don't mean I can't tell you like I'm bound <laughs> legally I mean I can't tell you because it's, it's the, the call just gets cut my, it's not part of my like job description you know what i mean there's but sure. there, i'll tell you what and he and he i, I think he'll be okay with this mm-hmm. uh, there's a guy on twitter named todd Vaziri. yes todd, i follow todd him for a long time yeah todd is a wonderful guy a really good guy mm-hmm. um, and he's he's very knowledgeable about that exact kind of thing many about many things in visual effects and beyond visual effects. he's a very smart guy um, but he's very happy to uh share his knowledge so i would suggest you hit todd up with that question tell him i sent you sure i will do that <laughs> and uh he'd probably start a whole twitter thread about what makes a lightsaber look correct and what we've changed over the years and how we do them because they ha- it has changed like we don't do them now the way we did them on phantom menace and certainly of course uh ever since the digital revolution that's a totally different technology from how they were done on the original trilogy sure. so um, but a lot of it is looking back at those old films and trying to make sure that it kind of feels the same, even though we're using 
totally different technology. But I would talk to Todd about that. Yeah. About passing the buck. I honestly don't know. Like, I don't know what um, he could tell you. It's because sure, sure. that's all. And is the it... funny thing is, that's the kind of work I wanted to do when I first started out, when I left CalArts, was this sort of animated effects like lightsabers and blasters and sure. electrical, things like that. More like elements now, as opposed to th- creatures yeah. and things. Yeah, exactly. Now, all this time later, I'm all about the creatures and things, and I, I don't even know how they're doing that stuff. Anymore. Hey, I think it, <laughs> I think it worked out, <laughs> as long as we get the both of you. Um, so uh, for people that are listening and are really into like the nitty-gritty, what software do you use at ILM? <laughs> For character animation now, and for quite a while now, we've used Maya. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of, you know, in-house written uh, plugins and, and add-ons to it that are, that are just sort of our own special sauce. But the uh-huh. basic, the basic, you know, program of Maya is is pretty industry standard now for character animation. There are some other programs, and um, certainly there's a there's a a uh, freeware program called uh, Blender that I've seen some really great looking work come out of that's completely free. Sure. Uh, crowd, crowdsource or crowd whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, but it's terrific. But, you know, Maya is what most of the big effects houses use and have used for a while now for uh, character animation, certainly. Uh, and, and that's what we use as well. Gotcha, gotcha. And so for somebody who wants to get into this kind of stuff, what advice would you give even like the crazy path that you've taken to get where you are now what, what's, yeah. what's something you've learned or something you would pass on to someone to follow uh, in your footsteps i think the main thing is don't wait to be invited what i mean by that is you'll you'll talk to a lot of people especially younger people who are starting out who might say oh yeah i, I got a film i want to make but I, I can't make it till i get such and such camera mm-hmm. or uh, I'm going to make an animated film, but I can't afford the software right now, so I can't make it. Don't wait for the stars to align and for you to have the perfect equipment and the perfect software. Uh, make you know, make a flip book. Uh, get your iPhone and do some stop motion with clay animation. There's super cheap so, uh, stop motion animation programs for the iPhone uh, or whatever phone you use um, sure. that are great. If you really want to do CG, like I said, go get Blender. Blender is completely free, and it's super full feature. In fact, it's so full featured that some people may be scared off by it when they first start sure. because it's like learning Maya. And, and then speaking of Maya, Maya also has like a learning edition, a personal learning edition, and things like that. So there are ways to get access to the tools in a way that didn't exist when I was a kid. I mean, you either owned a film camera or you didn't. And if you didn't, then, yeah, you were doing flipbooks on little pads of paper, which was the way I started out before I even uh, had a Super 8 camera. But sure. nowadays, people have access to, you know, you can cut your movie in iMovie. You can, you know, there's just so many great tools that are super accessible now. So I just, I just tell people, don't, don't wait. Don't make excuses for yourself about why you're not starting. Just get on with whatever you can get on with now. Uh, 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 I think that's the most important thing. I agree. I think that is incredible advice. And, nice. uh, just do it. That just do it. Do yes. it. Pull the Shia LaBeouf. Just... I get no money from Nike for saying that. That's so. right. Yeah. <laughs> we are not endorsed by Nike here at this right. podcast yet. <laughs> <laughs> but no, dude, I cannot believe. I just looked at the time. We've been talking for almost two hours. I know. Which, and I, I'll be shocked. Do you think anyone will actually stay with this to the end? <laughs> absolutely. Dude, this has been so much fun. Like, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your time. It's been fun for me, too. I, I'm so glad to hear that. Like, I'm I'm so excited. People are going to love this. Trust me. I, I know my peeps. <laughs> and this was incredible. Thank you for your time. Um, sure. I got to ask, where can people find you online? Uh, I'm on Twitter, just Hal Hickle, all, just one word, Hal Hickle on Twitter. Uh, and that's it, really. I don't have a website. Um, sure. My Facebook, I tend to keep kind of mostly to my family. Good so, idea, good idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm on Twitter, and I'm, I'm reasonably responsive when I have time to be, you know, if people sure. have questions or, or whatever. Yeah, I'm there. I'm not all, I'm not hidden or anything. I'm, I'm right there. That's right. <laughs> the password <laughs> is K2. That's but... right. <laughs> But yeah, this has been fun. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, it's uh, it's very very much appreciated on this end. It's my pleasure. I feel very lucky to to, uh, to get to do it. So fantastic. Yeah. And.